and welcome into the latest edition of Oh Mama, the story of the 2008 black and gold defense brought to you by South Hills Kia. 15 years ago, still hard to believe, 15 years ago, the last time the Pittsburgh Steelers won a Super Bowl, you know all about Ben Roethlisberger on the offensive side of the ball, that incredible drive at the end of the game to beat Arizona, the catch by Santonio Holmes in the corner of the end zone, all of it, but at its core, those last two Steelers Super Bowl teams, even though they had a Hall of Fame quarterback on the other side, were as much about defense as anything else, and this week, we visit with another legendary member of that 2008 Steelers defense. And pleased to be joined by the guy they called Potsy, James Ferrier, with us here on this edition of Oh Mama, the story of the 2008 black and gold defense, the last Steelers team to win a Super Bowl. And he was... For lack of a better way to put it, he was the heart of that defense right there in the middle of all of it. James, thanks for making the time uh, to talk to us here for a couple of minutes about that 2008 season and really that group of guys that uh, everybody I've talked to to this point, from Coach LeBeau on down, has talked about was really a, a family of sorts. You guys had this wildly close relationship, everybody on that side of the ball, uh, that everyone continues to credit for your success, really, both on and off the field? Uh, yeah, I could say that. And, you know, we were a really close unit, and I think we built that from, you know, the previous years. It, it wasn't something that you can just come in and just, you know, put in place. It's something that you have to build over time. And I think we had gotten to, the, to a point where, you know, we all felt comfortable with each other and we all – you know, knew what each other were doing on certain plays and, you know, certain aspects of the game. So it was easy for us to go out there and just play. What was it for you? Because I want to go back a little bit because you're, you're right. The, the foundation for all of this was laid previous to 2008. And you were a part of laying that foundation, not just in 2005 with Super Bowl 40, but you were here before that. And you were one of the first I don't want to say one of the first, but one of the first in a long time, uh, big free agent signings that the Steelers had during the Bill Cowher era, right? It was, it was, I remember being as a fan sort of taken aback, like, oh man, they went out and got somebody. Um, what do you remember about that time and being attracted to the Steelers organization, maybe from the outside that interested you in coming here and being a part of not just the organization, but a team led by Bill Cowher? Well, Thanks for uh, saying that I was a big, big signing free agent. I don't, I don't really feel that way. Uh, going through the process of free agency, uh, not a whole lot of teams showed a lot of interest in me, and it was very frustrating at the time. But you know, the Steelers were one of the teams that showed you know a lot of interest, and at the time they had Earl Holmes there, and he was a free agent also. So you know, Coach Coward told me when he brought me in that. You know, he liked Earl Holmes and he wanted Earl Holmes to stay. And that was his guy. But if Earl was to leave and, you know, things were to open up, you know, they would give me a call and they wanted to keep, you know, they wanted me to keep Pittsburgh in mind just in case, you know, Earl wasn't able to come back. And Earl ended up going to Cleveland. So that opened up a spot for me. And uh, that was probably, Pittsburgh was probably the only team that really wanted to sign me. So. It was an easy choice for me, and I made the decision right away, and the rest is history. That's wild to me because you were you were with the Jets previously, correct? And, and Yes. You were – I mean, I, I remember watching you with the Jets. I was younger at that point in time, but I remember watching you thinking, this is, this is the kind of guy you want in the middle of the defense, and it's wild to think that nobody else was on you and that if not for Earl, Hol Earl Holmes going up the road to Cleveland, perhaps we don't get what I think a lot of people – look at as one of the linchpins of this this defense that won two Super Bowls yeah it's funny how things work out and uh I've spoken to Earl uh, uh over the years and uh he was like man you took my spot <laughs> he was like yeah that was my that was my my team and I would have loved to have been on those Super Bowl teams and you know it's just how things work out in life and I think it was just meant to be so you get here and uh Pretty soon, you're you're a part of what is sort of the second act of Bill Cowher's career, right? 
Uh, J- Jerome had come over a few years previously. They had gone through a couple tough seasons, missing the playoffs. Uh, but you're a part of this rejuvenation, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And before you know it, uh, all of a sudden there's this uh, rookie quarterback getting thrown into the mix. You guys have that huge 2004 season, um, which people have talked about a lot lately uh, because of some comments Jerome made on Ben's podcast. But I saw that. <laughs> Um, when you look back on, I guess the early Ben years, right? 2004, when you guys went on that incredible run and a lot of it really was dictated by defense. And then 2005, which again was about Ben kind of coming into his own as a quarterback and the defense clearing the path and leading the way. Um, what, what do you remember about those last couple of years of the Bill Cowher tenure and getting that, that Super Bowl run to Detroit in Super Bowl 40? Well, I could definitely say Ben was the key and, uh, you know, his progression and his success was, you know, predicated to the success of the team. And our defense, we felt like if we held a team to, you know, under 20 points, uh, Ben could get us a win. And, you know, that was our mindset going into every game. And we felt like they they could do no matter what what the circumstances were in the game as long as we kept the team from scoring more than 20 points, we we felt like we had a great chance. What was that run uh, to Super Bowl 40 like? And how did that, I, I guess, lay the foundation for what was going to happen a few years later after the transition to Mike Tomlin? Just, I, I know it was a lot, it was very much about Jerome uh, naturally his hometown late in his career. He comes back uh, because Ben says, we're going to get you there. Um, just what what do you remember about that run specifically, aside from Ben coming into his own, like you talked about, um, that defense was was intimidating. It was, you know, I see clips of we all see clips of football 10, 15 years ago. And it's not that long ago, but it was much more physical. And you guys always seem to make a point to uh, to enhance that physicality. Well, yeah, I remember uh, going back to that 2005 season. You know, I don't know why Jerome decided to come back just because Ben told him that he would get us to a championship. But, yeah, he was crazy for doing that, but I'm glad he did. And, you know, uh, the thing I remember most is, you know, we're, us having a good, great start. We I think we ended up, we were 7-2, and two, and then the the bottom fell out and we lost three straight. And that that put us in, you know, desperation mode at the time, and. We felt like, you know, our playoffs had started, you know, we had to win every game, you know, to close out the season just to make it to the playoffs to be a six seed. And, you know, that was our goal. And so we just stayed focused one game at a time and we knocked them off one game at a time. And I think the last game came down to Detroit. And I don't even I don't think they had won a game that season. That might have been the oh and something season. I can't remember, but they they weren't a good team. And we felt like, you know, we had won uh, three previous games to and all we had to do was win this next uh, our last game in Detroit. And Mm -hmm. we we came out and we were losing that game (laughs) early on in the game. And everybody was just like, oh, man, we came this far. There's no way that we can just blow it to Detroit Lions. And, you know, luckily we got the win and made the playoffs. So you guys go on that run to Super Bowl 40. Uh, The following year, uh, Coach Cower gets one more year in. He decides to hang him up. Peasy leaves. You've got some turnover there. Uh, Mike Tomlin comes in. He gets hired. Young, up-and-coming, defensive-minded coach. Um, And to almost to a man, everybody I've talked to about Coach Tomlin's first season says, yeah, he wanted to come in and sort of reinforce that he, that he was the guy and we were going to play a tough physical brand of football. And so we had two a days with pads and training camp. We got worn out. And by the time we got to that Jacksonville game in the playoffs, we were just dog tired. Um, so do you remember the transition, I guess, being like that? And, and I guess, how do you remember Mike Tomlin coming in and somehow capturing a locker room? It, it, that had done so much under Bill Cower, and really, again, to that point, there wasn't a ton of transition. Joey Porter had left, but for the most part, it's the same team, a bunch of veteran guys who won a Super Bowl together, and this young hotshot coach comes in. 
how did he, I guess, win over the locker room and win your respect? Uh, well, going back, uh, Coach Tomlin and I played against each other in college. So he was on, he's only uh, maybe three years older than me. So, and I knew, I've known him from the past from other players that, that he's coached that are good friends of mine. So, you know, I had good, you know, good, I've heard, I heard all good things about him before he even got there. And I was excited for him to, you know, be our coach. And, you know, he came in, like you said, he came in right away and put his stamp on the team and, you know, let us know how it was going to be. It was going to be a tough road and, you know, we're going to have a tough training camp and, you know, we weren't going to be, we didn't make the playoffs the year before. So, you know, we had to change some things and, you know, he went about, you know, putting his flavor onto the team and, you know, we gelled right away and, you know, it, training camp was hard, but, you know, that second year, he took his foot off the gas. So that second year, you guys come into camp, and you're right. He must have he must have adjusted somehow because you guys come out on fire. You start four and one, five and one. I think you're six and three at one point. Um, and then really slam on the gas. Like the final seven games, you go six and one. I think you gave up an average of less than 12 points a game on defense. And really, the bulk of those points came in one loss in Tennessee – um yeah a, sh a shutout against Cleveland in the final game of the season um so what do you remember about that regular season um uh, when I talked to Larry Foote for example he talked about how this this rotation between for example you and he and Lawrence Timmons had started um on the outside they were trying to fold Lamar Woodley in and he really started to break out that year um William Gay had come along and started to eat into some of Ike Taylor's and Deshae Townsend's playing time how are you guys, I guess, staying focused on the task at hand while also knowing that there's this Steelers tradition, I think, as Larry put it to me at one point, where you bring along the next guy as well? Yeah, we had a lot of guys step up that year. And I think the main thing that made us successful was our front, our, uh, our front, our front guys. So Casey Hampton, Aaron Smith, Brett Kiesel, and then the two outside guys were outstanding. James Harrison and Lamar Willie, they put so much pressure on the quarterback, but just those guys that, you know, they made our jobs in the secondary and backfield uh, linebacker group, they made our job easy. So, you know, we were out there having fun because those guys were creating havoc every single play. And I think that was the key to our success. When you get to that Nashville game, uh, uh, the one against the Titans down there, that you guys lose. Um, that's also a, a lot of fans remember it as the game. Keith Bullock gets captured by the cameras uh, stomping on the terrible towel. And um, it, did that kind of stuff register with you guys in the moment or even throughout the following week? Or is it kind of like, no, I'm, I'm on to preparing for Cleveland now. I can't worry about that kind of stuff. Oh, you always put that in your, uh, your, your the back of your head. Stash it away. You, know, you always remember that. You never forget things like that. And uh, you just go ask TJ, who's Mazada, you know, about <laughs> messing with the terrible towel and what happens after that. So, you know, things, like, yeah. Things generally don't go well once you mess with the towel. You're right about that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's pretty well known. It's a known history that, you know, you can't mess with the terrible towel, but. You know, we definitely put that in our memory bank and kept that in our back pocket, you know, for later on. So you guys get into the playoffs and you're hitting all these numbers that when I uh, talked to Coach LeBeau about it, he said he always would give you guys numbers that he wanted you to hit throughout the season that were metrics of a top defense in the league. And you're hitting all these numbers, second in the league in sacks, I think 51, um, 86 quarterback hits. Um, I talked about the physicality earlier. Um, you're forcing a ton of turnovers, uh, holding teams to uh, barely three yards of carry in the run game. You get to the playoffs. Phillip Rivers gives you guys a little bit of trouble, but ultimately you hold him off and you get to an AFC championship game against the rival of rivals. The Baltimore Ravens are coming into town and you guys had jumped out to a 13, nothing lead. You're playing your prototypical style of defense you got Joe Flacco on the run, but Baltimore manages to claw back to within two. It's 16 14 uh, with about nine and a half minutes left. And the ball gets punted back to the Ravens just a little under seven minutes. And it's that classic moment where, you know, the, the crowd gets a little quiet for a second, but then you hear, 
oh mama um, and the song hits and a place goes berserk and bananas and coach LeBeau has told me he said when that song played I knew I didn't even have to say anything to the guys I knew the place was going to go nuts and they were just going to go out there and do their thing yeah it was it was quite a uh it was quite a song for us and we definitely got <laughs> pumped up when we heard that song but it, and it had been a period of time uh if you talk to Casey Hampton where we thought it was a curse yeah. We thought it was a bad sign. Every time they played had played the song, like we would give up a first down or something bad would happen. For a minute there, we thought that we didn't want the song anymore. But I think we got things turned around and we started making good plays when after the song came on. So we kept it. We <laughs> we ended up keeping the song and you know it ended up working out for us. And every time we played it that year, uh it helped us out. Well, and that time in particular, I think it's four or five plays later, um, you know, Troy reads Todd Heap, who stayed in the backfield to, to protect Flacco, reads Flacco's eyes, picks the ball off, runs it back for that pick six. Um, it's funny. Again, Larry told me this. Larry Foote said every once in a while, you guys would go back and watch the tape of that, and you would just marvel at the fact that the, the footage is literally shaking. It's vibrating because – the place was so loud. Um, as as you're on the field for that play, as you're reading it, what do you remember about that play? And what do you remember about Troy doing his thing where he would always have this tendency of picking the ball off, seemingly heading one direction, cutting all the way back across the field. And that's exactly what he did there. Yeah, I, I don't know what I was doing on that play, but I just remember turning around and seeing the ball in the air and seeing Troy nearby. So I knew it was going to be end up being a good play for us. And when he caught the ball, I think everybody just immediately turned around and, you know, tried to get a block so he could score a touchdown because we knew it was going to be a close game. So either way, so we wanted to try to get in the end zone. And, you know, Troy made some great moves and we had some great blocks. And, you know, we knew once we got in that end zone, it, the game was pretty much over. Yeah, it's pretty much sealed at that point, right? You're up by nine with, uh again probably about uh, six minutes left in the game yeah um you got to kick it right back off and get right back out on the field though and a couple minutes later I know chronologically in a lot of people's heads including my own before we started to sit down and look at this we don't remember as, as this moment coming after the Troy pick but it's the moment where Ryan Clark and Willis McGahey come together um and one of the most brutal collisions I think a lot of us have ever seen on a football field uh at that point What's your reaction? Uh, uh, you know, Ryan and, and Willis are both laying there for a while. Ryan eventually gets up and gets off the field, but they've got to cart Willis McGahee off. Um, as you're trying to put a game away in that moment, a game to go to the Super Bowl, no less, against your arch rival, um, does that affect you at all? Or do you kind of compartmentalize there and say, hey, we got four or five minutes left. We got to put this thing away. Yeah, when that play happened, and I just got to say, uh, that's the hardest and loudest hit I've ever heard and witnessed on the football field of my life. Ryan Clark, I mean, that that collision was, man, it was like a train wreck, and it yeah. sounded like a train wreck. <laughs> and I just remember I was close I was close to McGahee, so when I, when I saw Ryan hit him, I saw his eyes, like, roll in the back of his head before he oh. fell and hit the ground. Yeah, so, you know, I I was in shock at the time, and I saw the ball come out, and I was, you know, I was just trying to get the ball. And uh, it was definitely, you know, something that we just had to just put to the side and just try to finish out the game. But that was one of the most brutal hits I've ever witnessed. <laughs> I, I mean, it, 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 to, and you're right. That's right in your area of the field. So, I mean, you're close enough to hear it louder than probably anybody, despite the roar of the crowd. And, oh, to be, yeah. and to be close enough to see Willis's face just kind of go blank. That is, I mean, that's gotta be, yeah, I, it was I, scary. I, I, it I know was you guys scary. are trained, you know, as you come up playing football, you, 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 you do, you compartmentalize, but that's gotta be a real tough moment to compartmentalize um, in, in that instance. But again, to your point, you know, the Super Bowl is three or four minutes away if you can push through it. Yeah, and, you know, that's how – that was our attitude. And, you know, once we saw Ryan get up and saw that he was going to be okay, we felt a lot better. And, you know, again, he ended up going to the hospital that night and mm -hmm. spending the night in Pittsburgh. So, you know, it was it was a very violent hit. But, you know, that's a part of the game. And, you know, sometimes things like that happen. 
So you go to Super Bowl 43 now. It's down to Tampa. And I think some people look back on it and say, oh, you're playing the Arizona Cardinals. And the Cardinals as a franchise don't get a ton of respect because they've been down in the doldrums so often throughout their franchise's history. But that was a Hall of Fame team. I mean, literally littered with Hall of Famers. Larry Fitzgerald, Anquan Bolden, Steve Breston had a great year that year. Edrin James is on that team. And of course, Kurt Warner's the quarterback. Um, knowing what you had done to teams throughout the season, what you had done to offenses throughout the season, what's your mindset as you go into preparing for that game, as you're flying down to Tampa, getting settled in, media day, and how much did the experience of Detroit three years earlier help you through that? Uh, I, th- I definitely think the previous uh, Super Bowl helped us. That experience helped us out a lot, just as far as what to expect during that week. You know, the week of Super Bowl week is a hectic week and a lot of things going on, a lot of moving parts, a lot of chaos. And I think us having that experience and not having to deal with that first time experience being in the Super Bowl helped us out a lot. And I think we that helped us prepare uh, a lot better than, you know, we would have if we were just, you know, it was our first time. So I, I, I definitely attribute some of that to our success. and. You know, I was talking, me and Larry Foote were talking before the game and, you know, we were just shooting the breeze and we were just talking like, yeah, these guys don't really know. They, they've they never been to the Super Bowl, so they don't know what to expect. And hopefully we'll be up by 20 points at, in the, uh, by halftime and before they even know what hit them. And then, you know, it'll be too late for them to come back. And <laughs> it kind of played out so, sort of that way <laughs> in the game, which is kind of funny because I think we took an early lead and, uh, I think halftime ended up. It was seventeen seven. So it was almost how we how we uh, thought about it before the game, and it ended up working out that way. Well, you lead right into the next question, which is, you, you were almost down for it halftime, but oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. James Harrison ad libs um, and says, "You know what? I know it's an all out blitz. I, I'm gonna." just sit a beat and read Warner's eyes drops back and does just that picks the ball off. And as soon as it hits his hands and he picks it off, is your instinct to just go like pounce on him and tell him, get to the ground, get to the ground. So we can, you know, cause there, there's not a lot of time left. Maybe you think you can piece together a couple throws and get in field goal range or something, or are you looking at it and saying, no, we've got a rally now and we've got to get downfield because who knows what can happen. I was I was behind James when he picked the ball off, so I saw him catch it and started running. And I didn't I didn't had I didn't even think about the time. I just thought you know, go do. Coach LeBeau had been talking to us all week about the defense. If we get a turnover, we got to go and you know try to mm-hmm. score. So that was our mindset. That as soon as he got the ball, was everybody just turned around and tried to look for somebody. And you know that's what I did, but. As the play progressed and the play was going on, I saw the time running out, and it was probably about three or four seconds left, and I was like, I hope he gets out of bounds because we're not going to have time to kick this field goal right. if he doesn't get out of bounds. <laughs> and, you know, he didn't go out of bounds, so now it's like, oh, shit, now he's got to score. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now he's got to score. Hopefully he can get to the end zone. And by that time he got down to the 20 or 30-yard line, I was so far out of the play. I was just a fan watching by then. So, you know, I was just cheering him on and hoping that he got there, and he did. So (laughs) that's – it's funny you bring up Coach LeBeau mentioning throughout your preparation because as Bryant McFadden relayed it, he said there was a day during practice. He didn't say if it was back here in Pittsburgh or down in Tampa once you guys had gone down there. But he said there was a day where, you know, not everybody was necessarily rallying to the ball after turnovers in practice. And he said, Coach LeBeau got into you guys a little bit and said, listen, exactly what you just said, James, when there is a turnover, we are we need to rally because we need to get downfield and we need to treat every single turnover, even in practice, like we're taking it all the way back to the house. And he said, practice the rest of that week, then that's what would happen. Every single turnover, the defense would rally and take the ball all the way back. Um, how, it, it, you mentioned the idea of rallying to the ball when Troy picks off Flacco in the AFC championship game. Was that just one of those moments in practice where maybe 
I don't know, it's Super Bowl week and you guys aren't as sharp because there's so much going on. And maybe if there isn't that one lackadaisical rep or a couple lackadaisical reps in practice, it doesn't get reinforced by Coach LeBeau and we're not watching James run like a maniac 100 yards down the sideline? Yeah, I I believe that, you know, I think that practice was when we were in Tampa. And, yeah, it, I remember it being a lazy practice. You know, we're just going through the motions on defense. We get a turnover where everybody just, you know, take, goes back to the huddle. And Coach LeBeau laid into us that day, and we all remembered that. And after that, you know, he told us that we all just, you know, started doing our job and rallying when we got a turnover in practice. And, you know, it ended up, working out for us and carried us over to the game. And, you know, I know nobody was, everybody was, you know, expecting to go block and score on that play. And I think that was just because, you know, we emphasized that during practice. What's funny is if not for James sort of ad-libbing there and deciding to drop, that play never happens. And as, as Larry tells it, you know, James would do that fairly often and would come back to the sideline and he'd either have Coach LeBeau or Keith Butler or somebody saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? And James, in his typical way, typical way would say, don't worry about it. I got it. Um, <laughs> but it, yeah. how, 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 how often did you find you guys find yourselves, I don't want to say getting after each other, but m- multiple guys have said, hey, one of the things that made this group work as a unit was, we would hold each other accountable because we felt like brothers with one another and we didn't hold anything back. We would have officials looking at us in the huddle saying, are we supposed to break these guys up the way they're talking to each other and getting in each other's faces? Um, Have you been a part of other groups like that, James, or was that unique to this group and perhaps one of those special elements to what made these defenses so special under coach LeBeau, especially the ones that won two Super Bowls? Uh, I think that's unique in, you know, Pittsburgh culture, the Steeler culture, I think it's something that, you know, it was there when I got there. You know, everybody treated each other like family and we always held each other accountable. And nobody was above the team. Nobody was above, you know, the concepts of the defense. And if you messed up, we let you know about it. And it was like, yeah, just like, you know, brothers fighting. And, you know, you you do something wrong and you, you cause the team – you know, to not be successful, then you're going to hear about it. And nobody wanted to be that guy, but we all knew that, you know, if we made a mistake, we had to be held accountable for it. And, you know, that's, that was a key to our success. So there's three minutes left in Super Bowl 43 and you guys are doing your job. You're up by six, 20 to 14. Um, But then there's the holding call in the end zone. So pulls Arizona within four. And all of a sudden, Arizona's got the ball. And a couple plays later, bang, it's Hall of Famer to Hall of Famer. And Larry Fitzgerald is sprinting down the middle of the field. Um, You're down by three now all of a sudden. And there's less than three minutes left in the Super Bowl. After all you had done to that point in the season, is there a little bit of disbelief? What is the the sense on the sidelines? Uh, Total shock. We were so just like couldn't believe what happened and for I know for the defense for us to have that play happen and us to potentially lose the game because of that play was something that you know it was tough on us we were all on the sidelines and we all felt like if we lose this game it's going to be our fault and no matter how great a season we had all the accolades that we received you know being a good defense that year it was all going to go down the drain and at the Super Bowl, and we all just were praying that, you know, a miracle would happen, and, you know, Ben and those guys, they were confident the whole time, and we weren't confident at all. (laughs) We, yeah, we, we, we had players on the sidelines, we all grouped, everybody went to their own little group, so the D linemen were in one group, arguing about what happened, the linebackers were in another group, talking about what should have happened, and the secondary was in another group. Everybody was just in their own little group, just bitching and talking about why we're going to lose this game. <laughs> and, you know, we just ended up having to watch, you know, Ben and the offense go do their thing. So Ben and Santonio San do their thing, and they march down the field. And one of the most historic throws in Super Bowl history, Ben, you know, rolls out, 
fires it to the back corner of the end zone. San Antonio goes up, makes the catch, gets the toes down. Are, as you're watching it, are you watching it from field level? Are you looking up at the scoreboard to try and get a better view? And when it happens, what's your thought instantly? Is it, oh, man, we're going to have to wait for the replay? Is it, no, it's Tone. He got he got his feet down. Or is it, oh, no, there's no way. Just take me through your thought process as you're watching that, whether it's up on the scoreboard or trying to catch a view from field level. Well, if you remember a couple plays before that, Santonio had dropped a wide open pass. Mm -hmm. And that was that was crushing for us. We thought, you know, that was the one. And then on the on the third down play, I was uh I was on the bench watching it from the field, the field view. I wasn't looking at the big screen, but you know, when I saw the pass go up and I heard the crowd scream, I didn't see if his feet were in or not. And the ball looked like it was so high. Like I was like, there's no way he got his feet in yeah. uh, and bounds. And so I was like, I didn't even celebrate. I didn't cheer. I didn't do anything. I just was like, you know, I'm going to just wait for the referees to, you know, make the call. And once they, they were really quick with the call and they, you know, said it was a touchdown right away. So, you know, that's when I started feeling good. And I thought we had it. <laughs> Well, you guys still have to go back out there, though, and shut it down one more time. And uh, yeah. Lamar, Lamar Woodley gets the strip sack. I think it's Kiesel that falls on it. Um, at that point, is that when the sigh of relief happens and you finally allow yourself to celebrate a little bit? Well, you know, I did a little early celebration when I saw <laughs> Kiesel get on the ball and uh, we had got the ball back. I uh, threw my helmet off and was running around the field. And people don't know, but the ref threw a flag. So they were still trying to decide if it was a fumble or not. And the ref had threw the flag. And I knew he had threw, thrown the flag. I was like, why'd you throw the flag? He's like, you took your helmet off. I was like, Kurt Warner, he has his helmet off. You didn't throw the flag on him. Right. So I, I was trying to argue, you know, <laughs> make my case. But I knew that if they got the ball back, they would get an extra 15 yards. So oh. I was really nervous about that play. You were sweating it. Oh, man, luckily that – and I knew, you know, Kurt Warner had a great arm, so I knew if he had, you know, gotten that extra 15 yards, he could easily throw it into the end zone. And, you know, you got Larry Fitzgerald. It's right. like we got it. Our whole goal in those last 30 seconds was to try to keep him from getting the midfield so he could throw it into the end zone. And they – Willie ended up getting that fumble. I mean, getting that sack and Brett got the fumble. and But – I was nervous for about uh, a few minutes until they made that call that it was a fumble because I was going to be the scapegoat on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you look back on it now, James, and, and I read these numbers off to, to Coach LeBeau and a few other people, and they always kind of marvel at it and then kind of take a step back and realize, well, yeah, we were that good. Um, the Steelers, as an organization, as a franchise, and obviously the reputation of the vaunted steel curtain of the 70s and everything – the Steelers as an organization have only had four defenses that ranked first in the league in both yards against and points against. And only one of them came during the seventies. It was 1976, surprisingly enough when they didn't win a Super Bowl because Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer were both injured for the AFC championship game. The other three instances came in 2004, 2011, and they're sandwiched around the team we're talking about 2008. So if three of the four, if you want to use that as a metric, best defenses in the history of an organization that's been built around their defensive reputation came with you as a member. Um, how does that hit you and how do you look back on it now? Uh, I never looked at it like that, but you know, that's, that's a pretty amazing stat. Uh, we never, I never even, you know, thought about, you know, being that type of being ranked that high as, as far as, you know, Steeler defense, because you look at the Steel Curtain back in the days and mm -hmm. the Super Bowl championships. And, you know, to me, that's what teams are really judging on, how many championships you win. And going back to those days, you know, we might have had the better numbers, but, you know, it's all about getting that hardware. So, you know, even though the numbers are good and we felt like we had a great run with those uh, Super Bowl teams, you know, you still have to pay homage to the to those guys in the 70s that, you know, won four Super Bowls. When you look back on 2008 in particular and really that 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 range that I just gave you, the the mid to uh, late 2000s, I guess, as it were, that group of guys, so many of whom were together for so long. 
Um, how many of them do you keep in touch with? Uh, and and just how do you how, how do you guys I guess keep that close? Because you know I've talked to guys who well they're like wow well, it's you know it's fifteen twenty years ago I, I can't remember half of what happened. Um, but how do you how do you look back on it now, especially knowing that it is the uniqueness of this familial type atmosphere within this group that I know some of you guys still do keep in touch. Uh, pretty much the entire defense keeps in touch. We're all on a big group text and we all, you know, everybody's just shooting the breeze every now and then with some, you know, somebody's hitting, hitting the text messages with something crazy, you know, every now and then, but we all do a good job of keeping in touch with each other. And, you know, no matter how long we're apart from each other, whenever we meet up and whenever we see each other again, it's like, you know, we haven't missed the B. It's like we've been talking to each other every day of our lives. And, you know, that's the brotherhood that we have. And, you know, that's the bond that we created over those years. And, you know, it hasn't stopped just because we don't play football anymore. Well, James, I got to thank you again for your time. It's been great catching up with you, talking about this team and that group of teams and great defenses that you were a part of. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. All right. He was in the middle of it all right there with the green dot captaining and at some points keeping apart <laughs> the members of that 2008 Steelers defense lucky enough to be joined by James Ferrier this week on Oh Mama the story of the 2008 Steel Curtain defense brought to you by South Hills Kia I'm Chris Mack be sure to come back here 93.7 the fans YouTube page every Thursday throughout the season we will have a new episode of Oh, Mama, up for you. If you have not watched any of the previous ones yet, what are you waiting for? You've missed Chris Hoke. You've missed Larry Foote, Brian McFadden, Dick LeBeau, and we will keep them coming. Next week's episode, oh, big snack. Casey Hampton will join us right here on Oh, Mama as we continue our trip down memory lane, looking back on that legendary defense 